Let's talk now to Annabel Denham, who's deputy comment editor at the Telegraph. Annabel, uh, very nice to see you. Uh, thanks for waiting there. I just thought we'd get a, a few uh, dribs and drabs out of, uh, out of Jonathan Gullis, uh, who's looking very well. Um, uh, looking much better than he was when he was an MP, but there we are. Maybe that's what it does for you. Um, it's an extraordinary time, is it not? My question today is, where is Keir Starmer? Because we don't know. Last Thursday, he was in the UN uh, in New York and he was making his speech and David Lammy was there and Sue Gray was there and they were all having a lovely time. But there's quite a lot going on in the world and we haven't seen hide nor hair of the Prime Minister since then. And it's about five, six days ago. No, that's right. He obviously had a conveniently timed trip to New York to speak at Unger, convenient because there was that vote at Labour Party conference, non-binding, but nonetheless, unions um, and the left of the Labour Party made very clear that they were not supportive of the party's decision, mm. the government's decision to abolish the universal winter fuel allowance. Uh, but as I say, Keir Starmer went over to the US and we've not really seen very much of him since. Now, perhaps he's just trying to take this opportunity to take stock. Uh, he's not had a very easy first 80 days in office. The party has been marred in scandal. Its economic agenda has been exposed as utterly incoherent. Mm. And perhaps he does want to just try and take a step back and let the Tories tear themselves apart, which they're doing a pretty good job of at conference this week. Yes, you wrote about Kemi uh, Badenoch, didn't you, uh, at the, the weekend, because um, this whole idea of maternity pay became suddenly, um, out of nowhere, the big story of the weekend. And she kind of made it a story for herself, which she didn't need to do. Um, but you were not in favour of those who were criticising her. No, I think that her words were twisted, uh, perhaps deliberately misinterpreted. It was quite a jumbled exchange that she had yeah. with Laura Kuhnberg on Sunday morning. Ultimately, what she was saying uh, was that business regulation is excessive and she touched on uh, maternity pay uh, with that. At, uh, as I think that it has been misrepresented what she actually said and so far she was making a point about the burden of red tape on companies in the UK she was absolutely right they're drowning in regulation and each government comes in and they promise a bonfire of red tape only to just pile on more onerous burdens um, and so that, that that's quite clearly something that needs to be addressed and Kemi Badenoch as a former business secretary I'm sure has had uh, you know lots of exposure to it seen it firsthand um, on maternity pay even if she were saying that it was excessive she might have had a point it costs the Department for Work and Pensions three billion pounds a year it's not mean test means tested we should be asking whether that money could be better spent uh, in other ways mm. at a time when we've got a ballooning welfare bill we're spending about 300 billion pounds a year on welfare in britain at the moment um what i think it really showed mike was that the other leadership contenders don't seem to have any intention of reforming social security um and how they can make claims about economic growth without having a willingness to do that I, I, is far from clear well that's the thing i mean i spoke to a sort of campaigner who was at tory party conference yesterday and she was a very very nice middle class woman uh, who clearly had no interest in talking about what the real problems are in this country and she kept going on about the fact that we've got a falling birth rate and that people are not having enough children and we should be encouraging more women to have kids and thereby paying them maternity leave so they can take time off from their jobs and when I said yeah but what about the fact that we've got you know a falling birth rate but a rising population is that not an issue for you uh, with all the people who are coming into the country some of whom with their children some of whom having children once they get here and of course the other um, sort of uh, you know elephant in the room the 9.4 million people who are economically inactive um, who are also having loads of kids on benefits. Didn't want to talk about that. No, the system is completely broken. That we've got uh, over 9 million people who are economically inactive in Britain today, so that means that they're neither in work nor looking for it, is frankly quite terrifying. And we've got to find a way of overhauling our benefits system such that people who can work are really incentivised to do so. Now, of course, among the economically inactive, there'll be people who quite legitimately are not in work. They might be carers for a family member or they might be students, for instance. Um, but nonetheless, the suspicion must be that there are some people who view work as a lifestyle choice rather as something that they absolutely right. ought to be 
doing, uh, if they can. To your point about the birth rate, I think it's very easy to say that governments ought, ought to just throw money at the, this problem. Clearly, the UK's birth rate, uh, fertility rate is far below the reproductive rate, what's required to sustain popu our population or indeed population growth. Um, but other countries have tried this, spending vast sums of money. In Hungary, for instance, Victor Orban is spending around 5% of GDP every year mm. on pro-natalist policies to really quite limited effect. Um, you know, ultimately, my feeling, Mike, is that the genie is out of the bottle, that ever since the 1970s, we've had a steady increase in female labour market participation, and we've had women choosing to have uh, no children or fewer children because they want to, or having children later in life, because they want to pursue their careers. And I don't know how how we would ever stop that or indeed whether we would want to. And yes, you're right that we've tried to sustain population growth with immigration. But the problem there is that uh, migrants very quickly adapt to the birth rate of the native population. Yeah. So that isn't a solution either. No, exactly right. And what ends up happening is that more of what I would call the wrong people have more and more children. You know, you see all sorts of people who, uh, you know, and I don't wish to be unkind about this because people will probably castigate me for saying it, um, but, you know, people on benefits um, who are clearly, um, you know, what I would call the underclass, um, politely, um, who've got five or six or seven kids running around. These are the kids that end up, you know, taking wheelies down the, down the middle of the road because I've watched them growing up in a neighbourhood in London where I live. And, you know, when they become 15 or 16 or even younger, they become sort of antisocial. Um, and so you've got people breeding children who are actually going to become, you know, the next case of, of, uh, uh, of criminality. And I know that that's not always true. I know that sometimes there's exceptions, but there's an awful lot of that going on and nobody wants to talk about it. Well, of course, we do have the two-child benefit cap, Mike. Uh, that was brought in, I think, in 2015 by the Conservative government. And the idea there was that the state would support you if you had two children, but not beyond that. And it's remained in place ever since. But, of course, a storm is brewing in the Labour Party about scrapping it because it's regarded by the left as deeply unfair. Mm. But what I think is unfair, Mike, is the fact that you have very hardworking families where both parents might be in jobs, um, um, making all sorts of sacrifices in order to put their children into childcare, uh, pay their taxes, and it just seems like it's those people who, and they might make sen you know sensible decisions uh, not to have more children in order that can sustain their lifestyles, and it just seems like it's those people who are constantly being penalised. Yeah. We, fa we haven't we failed to liberalise planning so that housing costs are exorbitant and they can't get onto the housing ladder or they can't buy bigger homes if they did want to expand their families. Uh, we you know, labour are just going to tax them um until their pips are squeaking you know it it just it just feels like in britain today if you do the right thing then you're punished yes. and if you choose to have a, you know a life where you are perhaps more irresponsible then the, the state will just wrap its arms around you and the taxpayer can foot the bill well look at the front page of the times today Thirty thousand migrants living in more than 250 hotels at a cost of 4.2 million pounds per day um, and it now looks as though the Labour Party or Labour government have admitted that it's going to take at least three years to sort that out. You know, these are the same people who came in and said, we're going to get rid of the migrant hotels, we're going to move them out straight away, absolutely, we're prepared for it, you know, we've costed it, we've got everything ready. And they came into government, they got nothing ready. Um, and it looks as though Yvette Cooper is now privately conceding that it will take longer than she hoped to clear the backlog. I mean, really? I mean, are we playing toy town politics for these idiots? Certainly, it, Labour were clearly unprepared for government were they, when they across a whole range of areas. It seems to have been a real shock for the party, which appears in so many cases to still be in campaigning mode, mm. not least its incessant trotting out of the line that we've had 14 years of Conservative government in chaos and sleaze. But yes, you're right, the Labour pledged in their manifesto to end asylum hotels, Keir Starmer promised that it would save the taxpayer billions of pounds every year. And the fear at the time was that the way they would do that would be to just simply wave through applications, rubber stamp them, regardless of how legitimate the asylum claim might be. Now, the problem for every administration is that while they're trying to clear the backlog, uh, they're fighting against the tide as new flows are coming in. So we've had 100,000 new claimants over the past year. And that's why Labour's promise was so ambitious and the picture is further complicated by the fact we've got all of these channel crossings, 25,000 have reached the UK 
this year in small boats. That's over 10,000 since Labour came into power. So I think the question is, Vivekko is being deliberately vague about when she will deliver on this promise. How is she actually intending to do it? Is she going to have more people processing and how much is that going to cost? Mm. Uh, the previous government managed to get 20,000 asylum seekers out of hotels and into private rented accommodation. Is that something that Labour are looking at doing? But of course, it's difficult to find that private housing. Um, is there a way, as we've done in the past, of fast tracking some nationalities with a high success rate? For instance, if you're an asylum seeker from Afghanistan, you're very likely to have your claim um, be approved, but also take the opposite uh, approach, you know, where those nationalities which are unlikely to be successful, um, could we put them through a faster refusal mm. process and bring down the cost that way? Yeah, I mean, that would make sense. But uh, sadly, I suspect it's a very, very long way off. Annabelle, good to talk to you. Thank you very much indeed. Annabelle Denham, Deputy Comment Editor there uh, from The Telegraph.